In 1928, as I've already indicated, Stalin began to distance himself from Bukharin and the gradualist, market-based ideas of the new economic policy period of NEP. Instead, he began to lead the party and the state, uh, and indeed the whole of the Soviet Union, toward a radical policy of state-directed uh, industrialization, a policy that was, in fact, even more extreme than anything Trotsky had proposed, and certainly lacked the democratization within the party uh, that Trotsky had said had to be part of this new revolution. This so-called revolution from above of Stalin, which had enormous consequences for millions of uh, Russian and Soviet people, both positive and devastating consequences, is the subject of this lecture. Now, Stalin's change, of course, requires some uh, explaining. The most cynical interpretation was offered by Bukharin, uh, as he told Lev Kamenev, uh, who had been allied with Trotsky before, uh, and this is a point at which Bukharin is now um, the enemy of uh, Stalin. In 1928, uh, Bukharin told Kamenev the following. He explained it as rather simple uh, what Stalin was up to. Stalin, he said, is an unprincipled intriguer who subordinates everything to the preservation of his own power. He changes his theories according to whom he needs to get rid of at any given moment. It was now, of course, Bukharin's turn to be gotten rid of, and hence he changed uh, all of his policies. And, of course, Stalin had the administrative capacity to get rid of who he needed to at any given moment. A slight variation of this uh, cynical interpretation, though also in many ways Machiavellian, uh, is that Stalin was always committed uh, to a more aggressive industrialization strategy than Bukharin was, than the right uh, was, but he kept his views in the background for the purpose of defeating uh, the political and economic program of Trotsky and the left, partly because he personally hated Trotsky uh, and needed to get rid of him, but also uh, in order to ensure his own ability uh, to push the correct policy without uh, competition. And in fact, we saw some evidence of this notion that, that Stalin secretly favored a more radical policy and kept it hidden when we talked about Stalin's uh, own political uh, orientation. However, it's also possible that there was a gradual evolution uh, in Stalin's thinking as in that of many others within the party leadership. An evolution toward a more radical course that was prompted by this complex combination of economic and social uh, and political pressures of the 1920s that we've partly already uh, looked at. Economic problems, especially severe by 1927 when it was clear that growth was really slowing rapidly uh, and food supplies were being s delivered to the city in smaller and smaller quantities. Uh, and of course also by the growing discontent with NEP, which we've already seen. Whatever the causes of Stalin's uh, turn uh, against uh, the policies uh, of NEP, uh, his turn for a more radical uh, course of transforming society and building socialism, it's clear that once this turn took place, which became known as the Great Turn, it looked very much like a new revolution or a new civil war uh, even. Militant class struggle, idealistic faith in the cause, collective and individual heroism, and a good deal of brutality uh, and suffering. One sees this new militancy, for example, even in the economic plans on paper that were being announced uh, at the end uh, of the 1920s, especially in 1928 and after. The drafts of the first five-year plan in particular, which was to cover the years uh, from 1928 uh, to 1932. As these plans began to appear in 1928, early 1928, Bukharin's comments about them were absolutely scathing. He argued there really ought to be dif a difference between optimism and stupidity. Indeed, these plans for economic growth were optimistic to an extreme. During the drafting of the first five-year plan, there were strong political pressures coming from Stalin uh, in particular to be more ambitious. In fact, when the plan showed up, it was sometimes sent back and said it's too weak. Be more daring. Be more uh, bold. The result was that when the final draft which was unveiled only in 1929, though to start a policy that was already beginning to be underway, the targets for what had to be achieved in this first five-year plan period were almost mythical ideals. They proposed in this period of five years to quadruple the amount of electricity produced in the Soviet Union, to triple the amount of iron and steel 
manufactured. And also, on top of all that, to increase uh, the production of consumer goods, even while expanding in all areas of heavy industry. In fact, most economic historians looking at these written plans agree that the targets of the first five-year plan were completely impractical. There was simply no human way one could achieve such goals. In fact, to quote one well-known economic historian, he writes, in the absence of divine intervention, it's hard to imagine how these goals could have been achieved. However, from the point of view of the enthusiasts of this industrial revolution from above, and especially from the point of view of Stalin himself, the plan wasn't impossible enough. Very soon after this plan was unveiled, its target figures were raised even further. Then, for good measure, at the end of 1929, it was decided to fulfill the five-year plan and all of its targets, not in five years, but in four years. And on top of this, further amendments kept coming, raising uh, the targets. And on top of this still, the goal was not just to achieve these absolutely impossible goals, but everybody should try to over-fulfill the already impossible plan. One can hardly underestimate the hubris uh, in all this, the sort of utopian, mythic uh, thinking. Everything was possible. For example, geography itself, nature itself, uh, was to be remade with huge industrial sites and massive dams and huge canals. Rivers were to be rerouted. Uh, people, too, it was said, should be remade in the midst of this uh, industrial revolution or in the vocabulary of the time. People should be reforged or rebuilt. Uh, to quote, for example, from a 1931 pamphlet on the building of a massive uh, steel factory in the Ural Mountains, it said, it's not only the mountain and the steppe that are being rebuilt. Man himself is being rebuilt. In fact, when looking at all this, one could fairly ar argue that the first five-year plan was not, in fact, in any way a real economic plan, uh, not a guide to actual investment and in desired outputs. Outputs. The first five-year plan really, in many ways, was a political manifesto. It was a call to heroic struggle. It was designed to inspire people to greater and greater uh, accomplishments. In fact, the whole atmosphere of this first five-year plan reflected this, one might describe as the politicization of economics. And typical of Bolshevism, especially of Stalin's variety of Vol Bolshevism, this meant the militarization of uh, economics, evoking a revolutionary war. Thus, the press typically talked about uh, industry as a sort of battlefield, talked about fronts, the steel front, uh, the electricity front. It talked about campaigns. And when things were achieved, it talked about a breakthrough, as if this was a war. Shock troops, as they were called, shock troops of workers were put together and rushed to a particular factory or a construction site uh, in order to fulfill or even over-fulfill uh, goals. Many young people, again, as during uh, the Civil War, uh, young communists volunteered, or in many cases were encouraged uh, to volunteer, uh, to work on these huge projects, uh, such as the Magnitogorsk Metallurgical Factory uh, in the Urals, or huge dams uh, that were being built to generate electricity. Uh, and these volunteers uh, considered themselves, or at least were treated officially, as heroic fighters on the industrialization front. Finally, fitting, completing the picture of this militarization of economics, turning it into a revolutionary war, uh, those who urged more rational policies be adopted, things that made more sense economically, or people who failed in their tasks, and many people did, needless to say, were treated as if they were traitors in wartime. They were fired, they were often arrested, they were condemned as what, what was called bourgeois wreckers, even if they were workers, by definition, they were bourgeois if they opposed this industrialization effort, and many were sent to prison camps in these years. Now, the economic results of this revolution in economics from above uh, were mixed. On the one hand, growth, as you might imagine, was extremely unbalanced. Heavy industry tended to develop at the expense of consumer goods. Partly this is because this is where investment really ultimately was, was given priority uh, in building up heavy industry, machine tool plants uh, and the like, like, but also because 
In 1930, all private manufacturing and all private trade uh, were uh, abandoned, were uh, um, made illegal. And this, of course, was a, an area in small trade and small manufacturing that the state had no interest uh, in filling. So large numbers of consumer products ceased uh, to exist. Uh, a very unbalanced economic process. In fact, even heavy industry, which was the center of attention, suffered from imbalanced growth. Uh, among major problems that one sees uh, are shortages of raw materials, uh, including fuel and supplies. Uh, a desire to produce a certain number of machines was decided, but they never were sure where to find the raw materials for it. There was also the problem of overproduction. Many factories would produce things, uh, pieces of machinery, for example, that no other factory was prepared to make use of. So large amounts of manufactured goods, parts meant to go into other manufactured goods, mainly machinery, tended to be left outside of factories simply to rust. Quality also suffered uh, in this sort of industrialization uh, uh, development uh, movement since the emphasis was always on quantity much more than on quality. There are also, one should add, in terms of a type of imbalance in this process, given that this is a socialist uh, movement, uh, were very, very bad uh, working uh, and living conditions for workers in these big new factories and indeed even in the old industry. At the same time, it's fair to say that the achievements of the first five-year plan were quite considerable. Production did increase uh, considerably, though obviously nowhere near the impossible targets uh, that had been set, though we don't actually know how much production increased since all official statistics were so unreliable, uh, the facts are hard to see. But it's clear that production increased at a much more rapid rate and certainly overcoming uh, the slow rates of the 1920s. Whole new industrial areas were in fact uh, constructed as a result of these big industrial construction projects. In the Urals, for example, Magnitogorsk, which I mentioned, a big hydroelectric plant in the, in the Ukraine. Uh, Siberia was developed, all of which uh, played an important part in future economic development. And most important, it's argued by uh, economic historians, a foundation was laid by this rapid push, a foundation for future sustained growth that would take place during the following uh, five-year plans, none of which had this sort of extremism of the first plan. Now, all of these changes in industry brought about by the first five-year plan, by Stalin's revolution from above, were considerable. But there were, in some ways, even more dramatic changes in agriculture. Like industrialization, uh, agrarian development was also treated as a political, one might say, as a military campaign. Or in the language of the times, this was class war against exploiters, uh, against people known as kulaks, richer uh, peasants. Uh, and on the side of the state in this class war against the richer peasants were said to be the poor peasants who were allied with the proletariat, which meant the state and the party. Partly this was accurate, though in reality this was more a class war of the proletarian state as it saw itself against the entire peasantry as a class. This was a gradual intensifying attack against peasants uh, in the years from about 1927 when it first started through 1930 when it reached its pinnacle. Began in the winter of 1927-28 with the resumption of forced grain requisitioning. The problem of grain not being delivered in sufficient quantity became so severe that the state, this time uh, pushed by Stalin against the protests already of uh, Bukharin, though he was still in power, uh, sent uh, b armed battalions, mainly of workers and communists in the countryside, to insist as during the Civil War that they hand grain over at prices, low prices, set by the state. And this was repeated again actually in the fall of 1928 and again in 1929. The immediate results of these campaigns of resumed forced grain re requisitioning, the immediate results, were in a certain sense good. A large amount of additional grain turned out to be in the hands of peasants and was collected. But the long-term effects, as during forced grain requisitioning during the Civil War, were less promising. Peasants responded to the resumption of forced grain requisitioning by sowing less land. They wanted to make sure there was nothing extra beyond what they needed to eat that would be collected, resulting in less to collect and hence the, growing, the return threat of starvation once again uh, in the cities. So Stalin decided to cut the Gordian knot and attack more aggressively. The end of 1929, he announced a campaign on two fronts. 
First, he announced in December of 29 to eliminate, as he put it, eliminate kulaks as a class. Actually, the word literally was to liquidate kulaks as a class. And second, within a few months, uh, a few weeks, in January of 1930, total and rapid collectivization of all peasants uh, was decreed. What this meant in practice was something intense and violent. Hundreds of thousands of better off peasants, kulaks, and in fact many people that couldn't remotely be described as kulaks, were evicted from their homes by these same squads of communists and workers and their property entirely confiscated. More than half of all remaining peasants were forced into collective farms within a matter of months and the rest were forced in the next uh, year or so. The extent of this collectivization, peasants being forced into collective farms, was extreme. Virtually everything was declared to be the, the, the property of this new a collective farm, a kolkhoz, as it was called uh, in Russian. Land, houses, tools, animals, even private furniture and clothing was now said to belong to the collective uh, farm. And finally, as if to underscore that this was a class war, very much like the sort of class war we saw uh, during the Civil War uh, period, these collectivizers from the cities also beat up or arrested uh, various class enemies such as priests uh, or the local school teacher. And sometimes the actions were much worse, again, as during the Civil War. Drunken fighting, uh, stealing clothes for personal use, uh, taking icons out of peasants' house and smearing food on them, or worse, uh, rape, murder, and much else. Peasants resisted all this in a number of different ways. Some of them resisted actively. Uh, officials and volunteers from the cities were occasionally met on the road, beaten up, uh, stoned, uh, shot at, sometimes killed. More common, though, was mass peasant uh, passive uh, resistance. These peasants sometimes simply abandoned the countryside, saying, I'm not going to live on a collective farm. I'll go work in the city. Better to work uh, in a factory rather than become uh, a collective farmer with no land, with no uh, freedom. Uh, so severe was this outflow of peasants that the state in 1931 had to institute an internal passport system that prevented people from moving anywhere in the country without approval by the state. Most peasants, though, in a very typical peasant way, simply remained and accepted their fate, but before they gave in, engaged in one last gesture uh, of resistance. Rather than hand their animals uh, over to the collective farm, which they saw as nothing but a branch of the state, they slaughtered vast numbers of horses and cows and pigs and chickens. They ate as much as they could in these huge banquets of overindulgence, but most of it was simply left to rot uh, in the fields all around uh, the Soviet uh, Union, uh, a sort of visible, tangible uh, symbol uh, of how much peasants resented uh, this action. Now, the results of collectivization were, in some ways, mixed, like those of industrialization. From the, peasant, from the state's point of view, this actually went quite well. Their main goals were achieved. Grain procurements were now much higher. They could force peasants to work, and all the grain could be delivered to the state except the minimal needed for them to eat. Also, it was very pleasing to many communists that peasants were now firmly under the political control uh, of the state. Indeed, collective farms were branches of the state. The traditional peasant commune, where peasants gathered to make decisions in their traditional life, was abolished in 1930 with collectivization, and in its place stood the administration of the kolkhoz, of the collective farm, stamped, uh, staffed mostly by appointed officials, often from the city. In other ways, though, agriculture suffered enormously. Uh, sullen peasants generally refused to exert themselves, though could be forced, though the grain could be taken away, and other uh, food products, they would work as if under serfdom, uh, as weakly, as poorly as possible. In fact, many peasants themselves began to refer uh, to all this uh, as if it were serfdom returned. And they began to notice that the initials for the all-Russian Communist Party, or then the all-Soviet Communist Party, VKP, were also the initials for the Russian term second serfdom. It seemed to them a symbol of what, what this was all about. Productivity in agriculture also suffered enormously from this massive slatter, slaughter 
of livestock at the end, uh, in the midst of collectivization. This affected how much fertilizer was available. There was very little manufactured. Most came from animals. The amount of draft power was much reduced. There were very few tractors yet. Uh, there, therefore, there was uh, very little uh, left to pull uh, the plows. And animal products and dairy products, meat and milk, were much less uh, available now uh, in the cities. From a different and maybe even more important point of view, the most serious consequence of collectivization, though, was its toll on human lives, on peasants themselves. For all peasants, a traditional way of life was suddenly and almost overnight destroyed, not in the gradual way we saw peasant life changing, but dramatically and suddenly. Many peasants, in fact, adding to all of this loss of, their, of, of a way of life, also lost uh, their lives. Maybe uh, millions, it's estimated by most historians, died in the process of collectivization. They died when they were arrested as kulaks and sent to the camps. Many died on the way. They died when they were shot, as some uh, groups were, for being enemies uh, of collectivization. And the largest number died during a horrible famine uh, in 1932-33, mostly in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and many people believe this famine to have been engineered uh, by the state, that available grain in other parts of the country was deliberately withheld uh, from peasants, where harvests were bad, in order to force them to submit through starvation. Now, it's sometimes hard to remember when recounting the horrors of these years that this was also a time of heroic uh, idealism. Uh, in many ways, in fact, these two faces were inseparable for understanding this first uh, Stalinist revolution. Irrationality and brutality and suffering, on the one hand, was linked with idealism and optimism and making uh, a sense of making a better world. One sign of this was a pervasive idea at the time that this first five-year plans revolution was not only an economic revolution, but also a cultural uh, revolution, creating a new society with new values. In the language of the time, this meant asserting a new proletarian culture against the old bourgeois culture. And this was to be a fierce uh, struggle, a class struggle for the new. One aspect of this uh, cultural revolution what, what is what is called social purging. This meant various public trials against people known as bourgeois experts. This mainly meant engineers, not from a working class background. And this started in 1928 when many engineers uh, were accused of sabotage against uh, the Soviet uh, state. They were arrested, uh, they were tried very briefly, they were imprisoned, uh, and they were often sent to the camps. Even more important, communists everywhere in every part of society were encouraged to challenge the role of what were called non-proletarian experts, no matter where they worked. And here, proletarian meant not just of working class background, but also not holding to proletarian ideology. This struggle took place everywhere, in almost every profession and institution, schools and factories, even orchestras. In part, this cultural revolution, this social purging, this fight against members of the old classes or old ideologies was directed from above, very much directed from above. And yet it's clear that some of this took place, increasing amounts of it took place spontaneously, that local people, individuals, found this movement to be appealing uh, for their own reasons, exciting uh, even. For example, students at universities felt they had good reasons, positive reasons of their own, to attack non-party professors. They would hiss at non-communist lecturers, uh, lecturers during uh, their uh, courses. They would call them names, bourgeois, typically. They would shout out a criticism. They would, in many schools, insisted that all professors had to stand for re-election so that only communist professors could be uh, elected. And in fact, many existing professors in universities were replaced by young communists. The same was going on in workplaces and, and professions all around uh, the country where people were being replaced mainly by young working class uh, communists. There's a strong element of class in all this and a strong element of generational uh, struggle. Purging professors and writers and bureaucrats and engineers allowed young communists, especially from worker background, to move into positions of authority. Opening up educational institutions to workers also made it easier for uh, lower class individuals to rise into positions of greater influence through uh, education. 
But it's worth saying these were struggles not just about class, uh, not just about generation, the young against the old, but also about ideas. There were, frankly, for many, many of these people involved in this cultural revolution, a desire to transform everything about life that accompanied this industrial revolution, this process of collectivization. Consider, for example, uh, developments in education during the first five-year plan, uh, such as the efforts by an educational theorist uh, named Shulgin. He argued that everything about Soviet education during the 1920s was simply too bourgeois. It wasn't a dramatic enough transformation of life. The problem with schools, he said, is they're elitist. They're divorced from everyday life. And what was needed was what he liked to call proletarian education. Schools should turn into communes in which teachers and students worked cooperatively and not only studied together, but literally labored uh, together. And there was an argument that part of schooling should be engagement in real productive uh, labor. There was a very common view uh, in these years that work with your hands, physical work, was purifying, morally uplifting, and therefore should be part of the moral education of every child. Equally interesting and telling were ideas during these same years of industrialization and collectivization uh, among city planners. Various proposals were put forward and discussed widely in the press for a new proletarian city. Indeed, there were many national competitions to come up with these plans. These proletarian cities were all highly visionary. For example, a spiral city was suggested, or a city in the shape of a parabola. In fact, many cities were meant to have a mathematical structure and complex formulae were shown about the origins of the city as making a city happier through science, in this case, uh, math. A, a very widespread idea was the idea of linear green cities, in which there would be lines of industry followed by lines of parks and then lines of housing uh, and would be a more humane setting. Certain features stand out in all these various city planning uh, ideas. One, as you can see, is a radical modernism, a reliance on science and technology, even uh, mathematics. Uh, electricity is very important to these city plans, modern transportation. There was great faith uh, in the transformative possibilities of modernity in all of its uh, aspects. At the same time, one can see what might be described as a sort of anti-modern uh, ideal uh, in, these, in these city uh, plans. A desire to get rid of the whole traditional modern city altogether. Perhaps even get rid of the state as unnecessary in this new well-planned society. Uh, and in particular to create a city or a society without cities that had no compulsion. Uh, that was the ideal of what communism should be all about. And a good example of this are the ideas, rather typical of the time, uh, of a sociologist named Akhidovich working with two architects named Sokolov and Ginsberg. And they envisioned a socialist world in the near future that would have no permanent settlements at all. Everything was to be uh, in motion. Power would come from a big universal grid that you can tap into anywhere. Railway stations are everywhere, as are in the air, a dirigibles and airplanes flying about. It's a highly modern uh, vision. Even housing was to be mobile. You could pick up your portable housing cell and plug it into the electric grid uh, whether, wherever you wanted. And you can see this is a vision of the withering away of the city, but also of the family, seen as also a type of compulsion. These were one-person housing cells, and people could come together freely in any way they wanted. It was also meant to be a collective society, but in a free and natural uh, way. Uh, as Akhidovich, one of the, the designers of this plan, suggested, the stronger the collective li links between people, the stronger the individual will be. This deserves emphasis because though these radicals all dreamed of extensive transformation, they believed that it wasn't enough to just change the external world. One had to change the inside of individuals to liberate them uh, fundamentally. For example, one of these uh, designers, an architect named Milnikov, suggested that all his cities needed to include sleep laboratories, where thousands of sleeping citizens would be uh, gently inundated with these sounds and smells that were selected by scientists for their collectivist associations. Now, however bizarre this might sound and rather unfree, a sort of weird sort of musical and sensory brainwashing, the idea for them was that collectivism, their goal, should emerge not through force, 
but naturally, a gradually. In other words, these were strange times, these years of Stalin's uh, revolution, times of enormous centralized control, brutality, violence, but also times of idealism and enthusiasm uh, and optimism, creating better lives. No wonder, then, that historians have debated so fiercely about the meanings of these particular years of the first five-year plan of Stalin's revolution. I I've been to conferences where I've seen scholars literally screaming at one another over different interpretations of this period, literally breaking into tears. On the one hand, there are those who argue for the absolute totalitarian nature of the first five-year plan, the coercion, the violence, the suffering. On the other are scholars who say this isn't just a story of tyranny and victimization, though it's that, that people embraced Stalin's revolution for their own reasons, that they believed they were creating a better uh, world. The truth, as you can see, I'm suggesting is some combination of both, the contradictoriness of the Stalinist revolution. Next lecture, I'm going to continue this story into the 1920s, into the 1930s, a, a time when the party in some way retreated from some of these radical plans, when life became in some ways more normal, more easy, more pleasant, but also a time that witnessed the most bloody coercion yet, called the Great Terror.